Today we're going to begin a new series called Fixer Upper. I just want to remind you, let me back up for a minute. Um, what I'm sharing with you today, I'm, I'm sharing is uh, one traveler who's in this journey along with you. Um, I don't come as an expert. Uh, Beck and I have been married 26 years, but um, uh, I'm, I'm hard-headed and stubborn and hard to live with. And so I've had the easier part of marriage than she has. Um, and so what I want to share with you is what God's Word says and what all of us are trying to move toward. And so just want to begin by reminding you that marriage is a wonderful gift from God. But like a home, if we don't uh, perform regular maintenance, then it will become a disrepair, right? Um, that's why 50% of all couples who sign a marriage license will eventually choose to opt out rather than live with the pain and the frustration any longer. And so during this series, we're going to explore God's blueprint for marriage. And it's my greatest desire that each of us experience God's best for our marriages. And it will, it will take focus, it will take hard work, and it will take unselfishness. But I can promise you that it's worth it, that it's worth the investment that you make in your marriage. But I want to begin this morning by looking at what some marriage uh, experts, their research has discovered. And I think for many of us who have been married for any time at all, will probably agree that we see some of these same things in many of our lives as well, uh, even those of us who've been, again, married for a long time. But, but this is the research. It said, first of all, that most couples don't understand the difference between love and infatuation. Can't we all that have been married very long at all say we agree with that? That you go into marriage and you think it's love and it's really infatuation, and you really begin to learn what love is after several years of marriage or many years of marriage. Um, most couples have significant baggage from past family or other relationships. Uh, most couples don't have good communication skills. Uh, most couples have hidden or unrealistic expectations. The theologian Francis Schaeffer once said, sometimes the greatest deterrent to a very good marriage is believing that you ought to have a perfect one. Let me just read that again. Sometimes the greatest de deterrent to a very good marriage is believing that you ought to have a perfect one. And just sort of pause here for a moment. There is no perfect marriage, right? Because none of us are perfect. And so if you're looking for a perfect marriage, you will never find it. And so, so often we, we so long for that perfect marriage that we miss out on the fact that we already have a good marriage, that many things about our marriages are good, and we're so desired that they be perfect that we miss out on what God really has for us. And so it's really time for us to begin to celebrate what we do have rather than complaining about what we don't have. And oftentimes it's that looking for something else or looking for something more that oftentimes leads us into a place of trouble. Also, most couples come from homes where they didn't see deep love and commitment modeled by their parents. Many of us, like myself, grew up in divorced homes. And so, I mean, if there's a reason why they were divorced, right? They couldn't get along. And they gave up way too early. Matter of fact, my dad told me a couple years ago, my mom got, was pregnant with me in high, got pregnant with me in high school, and my dad told me about two years ago, he said, you know, he said, if I wouldn't have been so young and dumb, me and your mama probably could have made it. And uh, I think for a lot of us, we could say that we're young and dumb a lot of times in our marriages. Anyway, moving on. Uh, most couples enter marriage with financial problems or they have no clear plan for, mar for managing their finances. And oftentimes our financial issues are the, the main issue that divides us in our homes. We're fighting about money. Um, my family loves to hear the word budget, right? We've sort of gotten away from a budget and we need to get back to it. But anyway, uh, most couples do not have a clear model or picture of what a healthy marriage looks like. But they assume that if you really love each other, that things will just work out. And that just isn't the truth. And so what I want to do this morning is look at God's blueprint for marriage. And I want to use a visual to sort of help us grasp the viewpoint. And I just sort of, I think it's up there, maybe. There it is. Uh, and we'll sort of break this down and we'll compare it with Scripture. But you see the basic thing where God is on the top and you see man and woman at, on the bottom corners. And then you see that not only are we made up of body, soul, and spirit, but also our relationships with our spouses also contain those same elements, and we'll sort of look at those in a few moments. But I want us to begin by looking at Genesis chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 26 through verse 28. And what we see in Genesis chapter 1 is a picture of creation that is really from a wide-angle view. 
In other words, you don't see a lot of detail. It just sort of gives us an overarching view of, of creation. And also we see the beginning of how God brought uh, man and woman together. But then in chapter 2, as we look at in a few moments, we see more of a close-up view of marriage and, how, or marriage and also creation about how God put man and woman together. Beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through verse 28, it says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Just a little side note there. You did notice the word our, right? The, the, the word for God in the Old Testament, Elohim, is in the plural. And that's, I think it's a, a direct uh, looking at that you have the, the triune God that's made up of God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. That the three are separate and yet they are one and perfect in all the relationship. But anyway, after our likeness. Then he continues, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Don't you love the creeping things that creep on the earth? Um, some of you know Jacob Fitzgerald. He's from Lufkin. He's a pastor at Rusk. This week he put on Facebook, he found a, a little copperhead about this long in his living room. Um, he said he, he caulked his house up and weatherproofed it real well before he went to sleep that night. He couldn't sleep until he did that all the creeping things on the earth verse 27 so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them and God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth and then as we move to Genesis chapter 2 we see this zoomed in view beginning in chapter 2 verse 18 it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. In verse 20 it continues, The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from, from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And so basically the story goes like this. It, God created man, and he gave him authority over every living thing on the earth, both the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and everything that creeped upon the earth that God gave him authority over those things. That's one of the reasons why we ought to take good care of our earth, not because we're worried about it dissolving or, or being consumed by global warming, but because God has given us a responsibility to take care of the earth, right? Um, one of the things that I really can't stand is to see pictures on Internet or on Facebook of somebody abusing some animal. That just sort of gets under my skin. Um, and as someone told me this week, that if somebody would abuse and treat some of these animals the way that you see them doing they're more likely they're doing that to other people as well. So just a little side note. Um, and so then God calls the animals, male and female, to pass by Adam. And what did Adam do? He named them, right? I mean, can you imagine the intellect that Adam must have had to come up with some of the creative names? Like hippopotamus? I mean, who would have ever thought of hippopotamus or giraffe? I mean, he come up with all these great names for the animals as they came through. Um, but then after all the animals had passed by, what we find is Adam was alone. There was no one to be his mate. There was no one to be his helper. He's the only one in all of creation that there was no one to complete him. And so God caused him to, to go into a sleep, and he removed a rib from Adam's side, and from that rib he created Eve. And she was to be Adam's helper. And just a little side note here, it's important for us to understand that helper doesn't mean that she was subservient to him or that she was of less value. Matter of fact, in Scripture, God is referred to as our helper. And so I don't believe God is subservient to anyone because he alone is God. And so our wife is not less than us. Matter of fact, she is equal to us and that she was created to complete man. Um, I can't imagine life without my wife. Um, in every, every area that I am weak, she's strong. Um, where I tend to be sometimes sort of hot-headed and impulsive. She's not hot-headed unless I push the right buttons. Um, I keep poking the bear, and finally the bear growls and bites. Uh, not literally bites, but you know what I'm saying. Um, she's too nice for that. 
but, um, but all the things that I'm not, she is. And the same thing could be said about her. The areas that are her areas of weakness, that I feel those same things, that together we are a team, that, that one of us isn't any better than the other. One of us doesn't have necessarily authority more than the other one. We have different roles as God created us to have as husband and wives. God created specific roles for us to fill. But uh, we're different, and yet we are together as one. And it's important to understand that, that, that women are not less than their husbands, and they're not less than anybody else they work with. That, that we, that, matter of fact, most of the time, women do a lot more than men do, right? Amen. Come on, ladies. <laughs> I, was listening to, I was listening to Tony Evans one time preach, and... Um, he really was getting on the men and the women. You could hear them. They were hooping and they were hollering. It sounded like they were dancing. I was listening to it on a recording, and it sounded like they were dancing in the aisles. And he said, hold on, ladies, calm down. I'll get to you in just a moment. And so uh, anyway, so we're thankful for that. But then uh, Moses continues uh, as he talks in verse 23 and 25. He says this. And the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, talking about Adam the man. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Just another thing here, too, in verse 23, where it says that when Adam saw Eve, and he said that he called her woman, he wasn't just like sitting there going, oh, it's just a woman. I mean, he was like, whoa, man, I mean, it's like, uh, when, you look at the, when you look at the Hebrew, I mean, he was pretty impressed. I mean, it wasn't some lackadaisical laid back. I mean, he was pretty excited about this woman named Eve. And so it's important for us to, to be thankful for our spouses, in particular us men, that we need to be thankful for the wives that God has given us. But if you look at the, um, at the pyramid, God is at the top of the pyramid because he is the author of marriage. And the errors that move from man and woman to God remind us that God created man and woman for himself, that we are a direct reflection of God, that he created us in his image for a reason, that we are are to exalt him, that we are to identify with him, that we are to show, as believers, we are to show a lost and dying world what God looks like. And so God created us for himself. And then you see the arrows where you have men on one side and women on the other side, and there's arrows that connect them together. And this is a reminder that God desires a special relationship between a man and his wife and between a woman and her husband, that there's something special about that relationship. Um, just as a side note, several years ago, and it's been, I don't know, five or six years ago, I had a good friend of mine that him and his wife were going through a hard time, and and God blessed me to be able to speak into their lives. And I, you know what my counsel to them was? You have so much invested in this relationship. And it is valuable and it is worth saving. And that little simple thing, I'm not the brightest in the world. I believe that God gave me that when I said it. That, that it had great value and that it was worth working through the hard times and saving that relationship. And, and they have went on and they have had two more children. Uh, their quiver is trying to catch up with y'all's. Jordan and Brittany. And, um, and God is blessing them, and it's, it's just a, it's neat to see how God used somebody like me to speak truth in their life. And that's not to brag about me. It's just about God's greatness. But the key verse about marriage is, is Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast or to cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the fact that we are to become one flesh, it's a picture of oneness. And I, I want to walk back through this diagram, and I want us to, to, to briefly talk about the different types of love that, that God wants us to express toward each other in oneness. In the diagram, if, if, if I had this on a piece of paper, and you were to put one finger on man and one, one finger on where women are on the triangle, and you were to begin to, to work your way up that triangle, what would happen to the man and the woman in that diagram? Get closer together, Right? And there's a, there's a biblical truth to that, that as we get, as, as husband and wives, as we get closer to God, we get closer to each other if we are both walking in that same path. And just several key thoughts that I want to bring out. One is that, it, that uh, oneness in marriage is found in our relationship with God. That as we grow together in our understanding of who He is and that walk with Him, 
that we grow closer together, that, that oneness is found in that relationship with God because God is the only one that can meet those intimate desires of our life. Matter of fact, there's a lot of things that we seek out of our spouse to fill those needs in our life that really only God can fill those needs. Only he can meet those needs. The second thing is we grow in our relationship with God. We need to make sure that we don't leave our spouses behind. We need to make sure we don't leave our spouses behind. Because what happens if, if we're growing like crazy for God and they're still sitting down here, they know God, but they're down here, then we're steadily growing apart from each other. And just a little side note here. If you're married to an unbeliever, the, the key is to continue to love and to pray for their salvation. And to model for them what it means to walk with Christ and pray that God makes a, does a work in their lives. Um, when I was pastoring in Mooringsport, I had two ladies in my church that both their husbands were unbelievers. And these were two of the most godly women I've ever met. They must have been far from God when they hooked up with who they hooked up with. Because the Bible said it tells us not to be unequally yoked, right? But once you're hooked up, once you're yoked up together, then you need to be living in a way that you seek to lead that, that, believe, that unbeliever to Christ, that spouse. And if, you were to, if we were to go to Mooringsport today and go into my old office, there'd be two chairs sitting in front of my desk. And if you were to look at the seat of both those chairs, you would see stains. You know what those stains are from? It's from their tears. At least once a month, we would get together, and they would cry and they would pray for their spouse because they loved them dearly, and they couldn't comprehend them eternity being in two different places. And those two ladies would weep over the lostness of their spouses. And over time, both of those men come to know Christ. One of those, after I had been in Lufkin for about a year, uh, she sent me a message through Facebook, a private message, told me that her husband had prayed to receive Christ and was active in church. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? I, I think she probably prayed for her husband probably 30 or 40 years before he come to know Christ. She never gave up on him. She didn't pressure him. She just loved him, and she kept trying to show Christ to him. And so I encourage you to do that. The third thing is that um, God's desire is that we grow in oneness in every area of our lives, in our body, in our soul, and in our spirit. And so we grow together in those areas. The first area of our lives where God desires oneness is our spirit. And, and the key love there is agape love. How would you define agape love? How God loves us. It's a, it's a self-sacrificing love. It's the same kind of love that Jesus showed to us. The Bible says that, that even though we are sinners, that, that Christ came and died for us. The Bible says that, that we were at, it, there was enmity, enmity between us and God, that we were at war with God, and yet Jesus loved us so much that while we were sinners, he came and he died for us. That is the kind of love that we are to show toward our spouse. That, and it's, it's this type of love, this agape love, that it's, it's exhibited, it's shown as we are fellow worshipers of the living God. There's something important about us being together and worshiping as husband and wife, right? That we are to be fellow worshipers. The second area that God desires oneness is in our soul. And our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And the key love there is phileo, which is a brotherly love, and it's most often exhibited in a close relationship. And so as we think about this area of our lives, this, this, this soul part of who we are and this soul part of this relationship that we share with our spouse, that we are to be best friends with our spouses, that we are to love each other, we to enjoy, enjoy each other's presence. It doesn't mean that we have to be under each, underneath each other all the time, right? I mean, we do need some space, but we ought to be best friends. I mean, I can't wait when something good or bad has happened in my life to go home and talk to my wife about it. Because she's my best friend. She's the one that I want to talk to first. Actually, hopefully God first, but her next. As far as a human person, she's the person that I want to walk to. That we are to be best friends with our spouse. The third area that God desires us to be in oneness with our spouse deals with our bodies. And the key love is eros, which is passionate or sexual love. I started to tell you teenagers to cover your ears. Um, and is expressed in us being passionate lovers with our spouses. If you were to survey most men, do you know which area that they're most interested in? Yeah, the body part, right? If you were to interview most women, you know what they want? The bottom two, really. That they want, they want it's about the spiritual part. They want a husband that's going to be a spiritual leader in their homes, and they want a husband that's going to be their best friend. And I, I read this week, somebody said you, that... All three are important, but you can't have really any of them unless you have all three of them. 
That's not exactly how it was worded. But in other words, if, if we really want to have oneness with each other, we can't just focus on one particular area. But we need to focus on all three areas, that, that all three are vital and important in this because God desires that we be one in body, that we be one in soul, and we be one in spirit. And so I want us to, to go back and I want us to look at God's word. And I want to sort of begin by looking at God's process of marriage and how this blueprint, how we begin to apply it into our lives. And again, the key verse is verse 24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast, or, she shall, or they shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The, the first thing in this process that God has laid out for us is there must be a break. The umbilical cord must be cut, right? Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother. Our response to our parents is to be independent. It doesn't mean that we're totally separated. We don't ever communicate. Matter of fact, I don't think we're very healthy if we do that. But we need to be emotionally and financially independent of our parents. And those of us who are parents, I'm getting very close to this age since my daughter is about to turn 22. Uh, hopefully it's not too close, um, but it should be very soon or soon. But we as parents need to be careful in these two areas of both emotionally and financially. If not, we become a stumbling block to our children's marriages. They become dependent upon us instead of being dependent upon God and upon each other. Um, if, if emotionally they're still dependent upon us, instead of sharing their lives with one another, they share their lives with us, that everything's about us, that they're always dependent upon us. If financially they become dependent upon us, if we're not careful, what happens is we begin to use the financial support that we give them to manipulate and control their lives, and they need to be separate. I heard this week a story, and I've heard many stories like it throughout the years, but it was of a young couple who had their first argument. It was one of those arguments where the husband's eyes were bulging and their voices were raised, and they were, they were you know, there was no physical thing, but they were really mad at each other, and they were hot. And the wife said, well, I just go home. And so she loads up in the car, and she drives to her parents' house, and she begins to knock on the door. And the mother said the mother just opened the curtains like she was looking at a burglar. And she said the mother closed the blind back, and she didn't open the door. And so she kept beating on the door, and the mother opened the blinds back up and closed it. And then she opened the door, but when she opened the door, she had her foot where the door would only open about this far. And she asked her daughter, she says, what's wrong? And she says, well, she's still bawling, crying. He's treated me so bad. He's such a jerk. And, you know, she's all that stuff. And the mother said, well, you need to go home with your husband, and you need to work it out. And this was like 20 or 30 years later, and she said it was the greatest lesson my mother ever taught me, that I needed to go home and work it out with my husband, that we were to be one, and we need to be dependent upon each other. And so the first thing there must be is there must be a break. The second thing is there must be a bond. In verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, or they shall cleave to their wife. Um, I don't know how many of us use the word cleave. We probably use the word hold fast a little bit more. But when we begin to hold fast to one another, we recognize our need for our spouse. That our need is not, I mean, we still need a relationship with our parents, but our most intimate need is not our parents. Our most intimate need is with our spouse. That we need to be united together in oneness in every aspect of our lives. Um, just side note, going back up to the first point on the, 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 the break part of it. Probably the best thing that ha ever happened to Becky and uh, my relationship is that when we were married, I was already in Baton Rouge. Her family was in North Louisiana. So immediately there was about a three or four hour distance between us and our parents. Because I told you, I'm hard-headed and can be a real jerk. And so it was a good thing that it wasn't easy for us just to load up and go home to see Mama. She'd had to really work for that. But that was good for us. And then our next move, we moved to Memphis, Tennessee. And so almost all of our marriage, except for about a three-year period, we've been at least three hours or more from her mother. And it's not that her mother's bad. Her mother is great. Honestly, the problem is that her mother and I are a lot alike. And she'd want to tell me how to do it. Good thing she don't have internet, so she can't watch this service. <laughs> but she's the mother-in-law that comes to your house over the weekend, and when she leaves, all your dishes are in different locations in the kitchen. <laughs> because she didn't like our st structure, our order. And everything's moved around. 
Everything's stacked up in some place, and you've got to look for everything. Because we'd have stuff just strode everywhere. Not her fault. I'm a stroller. Um, and so anyway, we'll move on. The bond. So it's good that we hold fast to our spouse. The, the word there, the Hebrew word to hold fast or to cleave, it's that picture of like an epoxy where you, you, know, you have the two different uh, chemicals and you mix them together and they dry real fast. And when they dry, it is hard, right? And to tear it apart, you're going to almost destroy whatever you've glued together, right? None of y'all work with epoxy? The little thing's got the dual thing. You push like that and two different things go together and you mix it up and it sticks. That's where our marriages are supposed to be, that, that we, are to, we are to be bound together like an epoxy, that, that there's a strength with us together that's not easily torn apart, that it's not easily to separate us. Matter of fact, one of the problems, this is a side note, I'm going to chase a rabbit for about three seconds, maybe longer than that, that one of the problems is that we oftentimes view marriage as a contract when it's really a covenant. You know, contracts are meant to be broken, Right? I mean, that's sort of the view of our world. If you don't like it, you just break, a, you break the contract. But a covenant means that you've made a commitment before God and others that, that it's not to be taken lightly. It's not to be easily just thrown apart. That, that we are committed to work things out. That when things get tough, we're going to do everything possible to work things out. And so we're not to be easily torn apart. The third thing is the blend, that we are to blend together. In verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. We become one flesh. Our allegiance and our loyalty is to our spouse. Our marriage matters more than our kids. Our marriage matters more than your job. I know many of you have young children. You can't imagine the day, but one day your kids are going to grow up and they're going to move off on their own. And at that moment, you're going to hope that whenever they move off, that they, they stay off, Right? Those of you who have adult children, you hope they, not that you don't come home and see mom and dad, but you hope they have their own location, their own place, and they sort of stay there, right? Am I the only parent? I mean, mine isn't there yet. Yeah. You got your new wife or your new husband? You all work things out. They come home, you hope it's just for a visit. And so there, there comes a day that your kids are out of your home, and if, if your life is all about your kids, then... Your marriage, you, what do you do? You have to almost start back at ground zero because you've neglected that marriage for so many years that you need to make sure you work together. Also about your job, that you know, at some point, hopefully we will retire, right? I may never retire. I think it was Richard said that one day. He'll be about 80 when he retires. I'll probably be that same person. I'll probably be about 80 or 90 when I finally retire. Um, they'll have to put some kind of lift up to the pulpit or have some younger guys lift me up and stick me behind the pulpit. And, um, but eventually we hope we retire. So what do you do if your job is your life and you've neglected your marriage to do that? Then, you know, what have you done? But listen, marriage is hard. But when we commit to work it according to God's plan, we can know that it comes with great reward. And so the second thing I want us to talk about quickly is God's reward. And that is the reward is intimacy. In verse 25, it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. When we experience physical, emotional, and spiritual oneness, the result is intimacy. But listen, I don't want you to miss the point that no one experiences intimacy 24-7 for 365 days a year. You know why? Because as we get closer to God, we get closer to each other, we become experiencing intimacy, we get in each other's space, right? And so our natural reaction is when somebody starts getting in our space is to do what? Either push them back or we move back, right? And I mean, I know some of you, your personal space is really big. That somebody gets in that personal space, you really start. And so it's something we have to continually work at. That marriage is not easy. It's the, the spiritual oneness, this intimacy that God has given us, that he's promised as a reward for those who, who live in, in, in uh, oneness, it's not easy to maintain. It requires constant work. They work things together. I want to quickly go through an intimacy test. And I, I wish I'd have had this to Tara or so that she could have printed it out because it'll be easier to follow along. But I'm going to go through this really quick. And I, maybe you can just, uh, if you see something that jumps out at you, make a little note or make a mental uh, response. But on a scale of one to five, with one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree and not using the three, you know, three is really a cop-out, isn't it? That means you really don't want to admit that it's bad. 
or you don't want to seem arrogant and say that it's good, so you just write down three. And so trying to stay away from the three. The, the first one is evidence of spiritual intimacy. The, the first question to ask yourself is this, or to, the, yeah, to ask is, is this true of you, or, or where would it fall? You strongly disagree with this statement, or you strongly disagree or strongly agree? My spouse and I often tend to agree on many of the important issues concerning values and beliefs. If you've been married very long, that one's probably not that hard to answer. The second is that we seem to practice honest conversation followed by genuine forgiveness when one of us has hurt the other. Third, as a couple, our spiritual closeness through prayer or sharing scripture insights is quite good. So you see the three statements. The second area is evidence of emotional intimacy. First of all, I remember special times when my spouse and I shared strong emotions like grief, sadness, joy, or brokenness. Special times where we shared strong emotions like grief, sadness, joy, or brokenness. Second, we seem to be good at giving one another undivided attention when listening or talking. It means we mute the TV or we put the cell phone down. Don't be laughing at me. Yeah, Becky said if I said something real crazy, she's going to come up and get one of those mics and answer the question another different. So, Third is verbalizing my needs and desires concerning our relationship to my spouse would be normal for me. Verbalizing my needs and desires concerning our relationship to my spouse would be normal for me. The third area is evidence of physical intimacy. We seem to prioritize frequent times of quality talking and having dates together. That's, that must have been a woman that wrote that question. <laughs> or a smart guy. Or what is that? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> you know, you have small children when you ask that question. <laughs> or lots of children. Uh, second, I'm comfortable communicating my sex desires and preferences to my spouse. That was probably written by some man. <laughs> um, and the third one probably as well. I'm very satisfied with my spouse's sensitivity in meeting my sexual needs. All right, you see the questions. What, what I want to encourage you to do is to sometime, maybe today, before you forget, I want to encourage you to, to talk about the areas that you feel like you're doing well and some of the areas that you feel like you need to be working on. Several years ago, Becky and I went to a church planner evaluation thing. Um, and one of the things that I got slammed on, and honestly, I've sort of moved back toward, was this, the date thing. I mean, a date was like, Getting pizza and going home and watching a movie. Um, that's not good, right, women? Uh, yeah, that's not really a date. And it's really bad whenever you're like, um, you know, you're empty nester and you steal that's your date. That's really bad because you don't have any excuse about child care. Um, but I really want to, but anyway, so that was one of the areas that, that they really said, you know, hey, y'all need to really be working in that area uh, you both have a good, you feel like your marriage is doing pretty good, but we think that that would help it take that next step up. And so just want to encourage you to, to sort of walk through, talk through these things, to try to begin to work on intimacy. And again, just to remember that, that intimacy is hard work, that we have to be vigilant, we have to, be, uh, we have to keep working at it. If we don't, we will drift apart. It's amazing how many folks have been married 30-plus years and then all of a sudden they get divorced because through the years they've just drifted apart. They've not worked on it. It's, it's sort of like your house. If you don't work on it, it, it will fall apart. Same thing with your car. If you don't do basic maintenance on your car, eventually it's going to give out. And so I challenge you to do that. The third thing is God's purpose. So what is God's purpose in our marriages? And we'll, we'll try not to stay here too long. But the first one is physical reproduction and pleasure. Uh, Genesis 1, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Some take that more seriously than others. And fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so one of God's purpose for our physical intimacy is that we would populate the earth. The second part of that is the pleasure part. And, I, and this is an area that in churches that I think a lot of times we've neglected our responsibility. And now we've turned it over to the world, whether it's Hollywood or whether it's the school systems to teach our children, to teach each other about what sexual intimacy should look like. And so we end up with this, this false narrative of what it ought to look like, and it doesn't look like what God defines it as, right? And there's, a, there's times that people that grew up in the church, they don't believe that this is 
that this, it's almost a sinful thing, that, that sexual intimacy is sin, but in reality, God says something totally different. Matter of fact, Proverbs 5 is pretty direct, and if you want to think about it, there's a whole book in the Bible that deals with it, right? Song of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, however you want to call it. Proverbs 5, verse 18 through 20. It says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Oop, I said that in church. Be intoxicated always in her love. I mean, that's pretty direct, isn't it? Be intoxicated always in her love. He says, Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? And so there's strong, there's strong teaching throughout Scripture about our sexual intimacy and what it should look like and what it should not look like. And there ought to be bounds to our marriages, so it's important that we do that. And so God has declared that, that, that sexual intimacy is for populating the earth and also for pleasure as well. The, the second thing is talking about relational intimacy. Going back to verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that, a man, that the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper fit for him. Listen, the wife is an indispensable partner, and she completes the husband. And the other can be said about the wife and her husband as well, so that together they can achieve their divine calling. That there's intimacy as we work together. In verse 25, it goes on and says, The man and his wife are both naked and were not ashamed. The phrase that they were both naked and were not ashamed implies that Adam and Eve had nothing to hide from themselves, their spouse or their God. There was some intimacy there between Adam and Eve. We don't really think about that when we read that text, do we? We think about, well, they were, they were naked and they did, there was no sin there, so they were not ashamed. But it really talks about intimacy, that there was an intimacy in their lives between the, their, them and their wives and also between God, that there, was, that, where there was nothing that they had to hide from one another. They shared oneness and they shared intimacy in their lives. The, the third area is spiritual impact. Listen, if we're going to impact the world, we will do so by how we treat one another as husbands and wives. We don't have the time to look at it. We're going to look at one long passage. But if you go and you begin to look through both the Old Testament and even the New Testament, even the words of Jesus and Paul, the Apostle Paul as well, the marriage relationship is compared over and over again between God's relationship and his people. And that, one, the, the, that when we start talking about communicating uh, the church and about our relationship with God, probably the main, area, the main thing we see used to describe that is a body right? That, that we are one, but yet we are, we are many. But the second area is about the relationship between a husband and his wife. It, in the marriage relationship, it is a picture of Christ and his church. And, we, and it's through our relationship with one another that we communicate what that relationship with God should look like. And as we seek to live for God, and our lives are different from those around us, those who are non-believers and they see things missing in their relationship with their spouse and they see what we have with our spouse, then they want to know what the difference is because there's something different in us. Again, quickly, I'm, we don't have to, I'm not going to go through and describe it. I'm just going to read the text. Uh, beginning in verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and as himself, its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Those who think the word submit is an ugly word, Think about this. The church is to submit to Christ in the same way the husband is to submit, or the wife is to submit to her husband. It's more, about, it's more about leadership, it's more about direction than it is being a servant in the home. It's not that the husband is to, to lord it over the wife. Matter of fact, the word, that, the word there for submit means the wife willingly submits to her husband. It means if we love our wives the way Christ loves the church, then our wives will follow our leadership without any questions. Right? Unless they're out of will with God and they just want to be rebellious. We'll talk about that next week in Genesis 3. Not about the wives per se, but the barriers in relationships. 25. I didn't mean to do that. That wasn't the point this week. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Again, just sort of chase a little rabbit here. Man, it, it, that's a picture of elevating and exalting our wives, is it not? That, that we are to love them, not because they're weaker than us, but because we love them. That we hold them in high regard, and we show them respect, and we show them love. Continue on in verse 28. In the same way, husbands should uh, love their wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Moving on in verse 32. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she respects her husband. We see it here that, that there's a mystery. There's a mystery of Christ and his church, and it's the marriage relationship between a husband and wife, and how we submit to one another, and how we love one another. There's a picture of how Christ loves his church, and how his church loves him, that we bear testimony of his greatness. Just a, sort of a couple of thoughts as we wind things up that I want to add for you to think about. One, what practical steps could you take to develop spiritual intimacy in your marriage? What are some things you need to do in your marriage to develop spiritual intimacy? Of being the husband and wife that clearly reflects a couple who is in love with Jesus. What can you do? Second, what practical steps could you take to develop emotional intimacy in your marriage? That you're really sharing your lives together where you are best friends and you're investing in each other's life and you're growing in intimacy uh, with one another in an emotional way. And then finally this. As we, um, as we close in prayer, and I'm going to ask Jordan to come. We're not going to drag this thing out. I know I've already preached long this morning. But um, maybe this morning... You and your spouse need to make a commitment together. You may be in a great place, but I'd be willing to bet that many of us are struggling in our relationships. And, but some of us are doing great, but we want to commit to do more or do better. If you would like to make this commitment, if you feel led to make a commitment to, to really work on specific areas in your marriage, I want to encourage you just with your spouse to come and to kneel and to pray. You want to pray for an hour and a half. Just ask God to work and say, God, we're going to commit before you and before our brother, sister in Christ, that we're going to work on our marriage, that we're going to take it to the nth degree, that we're going, to, we're going to make sure that our marriage is healthy and strong and that we're going to continue to work toward that. Because if we don't work toward that, then eventually we'll, we'll drift apart and it will fall apart as well. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, we know that either as an individual or as a couple that we need a church home and we feel like this is a place to be. Um, somebody told me the other day, said, y'all never ask people about joining the church. And so I'm trying to do it today. Um, I'm not going to name the name, but I think it was Dawn that told me that. that um, and so if you feel led to join this church, I encourage you to do it. It's a great place.